Hello and welcome to the Animation Communication Podcast, your source for discussion about animation, film, fandom, and more. So please, join your host, I Love Kim Possible A Lot, or KP, and Lauren Kizich, the Abbey Roadie, for today's discussion. If you like what you hear, please remember to support by giving a like, a follow, as well as subscribing to the main I Love Kim Possible A Lot channel on YouTube. Spread the word, and keep being a part of a great community. This episode contains some mild adult language. Welcome, everyone, to this episode of Animation Communication. Um, I'm KP, joined by my co-host, Lauren. Say hi, Lauren. Hello, Lauren. Uh, this is why I don't bring you out in public. Anyway, um, and this is our coronavirus um, episode, I guess. And uh, we're trying to, we're still going to do the podcast. Luckily, a podcast is pretty easy to remotely do. Like, I had to fly back home to my parents' house, and we're, I'm probably here for until further the notice, you know, and Lauren's, like, in, in you know, in Glendale, just, like, with, with the bunkers up and stuff like that. So hopefully this podcast will help you get through your boredom of watching and um, watching just a lot of junk and just listening to a lot of junk, and hopefully you'll learn something. So if you haven't listened to all of the podcasts up to this point, please do so. They're interesting. They're not all as coronavirus-esque. Um, PTS, PSA, not PTSA, that's, that's the wrong one. Um, You're going halfway through PTSD. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I know how to say, because that's, 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 it's hard for me. Lauren, don't, don't <laughs> judge me. I am, I'm there. I'm not there. judging. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> anyway, so, um, you know, so we'll just, so this will be our general coronavirus ask addressing some just general health concerns. We're not doctors, we're just animation nerds. So please, like, go listen to the actual doctors saying stuff, but we'll just kind of regurgitate some of the, the obvious things that you should be doing and I had a con I had an episode where we talked about conventions and stuff and we're kind of keeping that on hold because maybe now it's not the best time to release it so you know um joining me I'll shut up joining me um we also have a guest this this week um say hi Matt tell everyone tell all five people what you do on the internet Hello, everybody. Yes, it's me. Uh, my name is Matt Brune, but you may know me more as Animat. And I have a YouTube channel, Electro Dragon 505, where I talk about animation in all kinds of ways. I talk about animation history with Animation Look Back. Uh, I review them. Well, mainly animated films with Animat's reviews and Animat's classic reviews and so much more. Basically, I'm just a YouTuber mainly talking about animation. Yeah. Um, thanks, Matt. So Matt's kind of um, one of the go to guys as far as really in depth animation um, history and animation historian. Um, so Lauren and I are more on the creative side. We probably know more about animation than, than the healthy amount, I would say. So um, but, but I think Matt's kind of the, the expert as far as um, especially studio um, climates um, in specific in specific ages of animation. So that's why we thought We'd have him here and um, he'll learn you. So this episode, before we, when we get into the actual discussion point and slash interview thing, I guess, kind of, um, this will be the broad kind of general history of animation in future episodes. If there's demand, we'll go into animation history by studio because, you know, there's more than just animation history than Disney. I hate to break it to you. Oh, no. Yeah, this is a quick crash course on everything animation. I'll do my best to go into the basics of like some of the main things as we go. There's still a lot, but I'll do my best to try to summarize it as quickly as possible. Yeah, uh, because like I could go on for hours with this thing. Well, um, the podcast is relatively flexible, so if you maybe not maybe not like hours and hours and hours, but I guess we'll just kind of have a more like half an hour, 45 minute condensed version. And then you guys can do your homework and kind of um, learn about your own animation history. But um, history is a good point to, to, to learn about in general, because um, once you learn about history, you can kind of understand the decisions that we're in today, regardless of it, whether it's animation history or um, just regular history. And I always enjoyed history in high school and I had a really anal teacher about it um he would he i might have i might have mentioned that oh i mentioned this on the 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 show with um the me and me and matt's um episode but I, in high school 
um, I'll shut up in a second, but in high school, um, my, and my history teacher would, he, he hated the, the Anastasia movie desperately, and he had a hammer in his desk that he kept called the, I think it was like the Anastasia Smasher or something like that. So people would bring, oh my old, god, go ahead, Lauren. No, no, I was just going, oh my god. <laughs> no, it gets worse. So, um. So people would bring him old VHS ta- um, copies of their Anastasia movie, and he would smash the VHS tape up, and then he would, um, he would like take the the celluloid film and like drape it across his um, his 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 um, I guess his room, right, his teaching room. So you know there'd all be the celluloids. Um, Anastasia and I would always get mad at that because regardless of you know like film in general as a medium is historically you know it's artistic license-esque heavy and you know if they want to like you know if children want to watch an Anastasia documentary about it then they can go on the history channel and maybe have a watered down version of that but you know people like I understand the marketing but it's it's kind of up to the parents to educate their children about the real histor- historical aspects of Anastasia or same thing like with American Tale and the immigration and the Jews and all that stuff. So, um, you know, it, 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 like there's there's so many worse movies that you could have a grudge over than Anastasia. There's so many like more historically inaccurate movies that, you know, are far worse contenders than Anastasia. Like, at least it had, like, a couple of the characters from history, you know, there's, you know, they, they, they like, there were people with Russian accents and stuff, and, you know, at least it's got cough, that cough. going for it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it's cough, cough, well, bad I mean... Titanic movies, cough, cough. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, but for real, though, like, when it, when it comes to the relationship with animated films and like historians in general historians don't necessarily look fond over animated films because like usually when you watch an animated movie they are the last place to go to if you want to look for something that would be historically accurate now this is not to say there aren't animated films that are historically accurate but at least some of the mainstream or well-known ones Yeah, there have been plenty that historians are really upset over. It's not just Anastasia, but stuff like uh, Disney's Pocahontas, for example. Mm -hmm. Like, that is an extremely botched up uh, historical representation of it. Or um, another example, like um, uh, that that Warner Brothers King and I movie. I mean, like... I know it's I know it's based on the Rodgers and Hammerstein musical, but it is still based on true events. Mm -hmm. And connecting that to the true events, I don't think the villain has magical powers and an assistant that's like a Buddha of comic relief that's continuously losing his teeth. You mean they didn't actually have dragons? What? (laughs) No, they don't defeat them by whistling a happy tune. (laughs) Oh man, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to change my marketing. Um, <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's my bad joke, I guess. But, um, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's, um, uh, uh, before, yeah, we, before we, we're getting a little bit off topic, but that's what podcasts are for. So before we get into it, I think it's a matter of like, you have to have a balance between finding, tr- like finding an artistic angle for the movie, for, for your, for your narrative in general. And then just kind of like, I think Prince of Egypt did it best. where just like, this is based on historical events we made or you know, a story that exists, you know, we'll get into that whole, th- that's, that's, that's a, that's a topic, like, I don't want to touch right now, but anyway, this is based on a pre-existing, you know, biblical story, you know, artistic liberty was changed, you know, go listen to the biblical story if you want the biblical thing, but we, like, you know, as, as artists and storytellers, you have to find the angle that is the best story and the best narrative, and sometimes history doesn't really match up with that, so, you know, it's not the film's fault that, you know, it's it's not true. You know? <laughs> like people should know should know better. And I think Anastasia specifically had the disadvantage of coming out like a decade before they actually found proof that Anastasia did die b- via DNA evidence. And it's just like, well, I guess I guess that sucks for that film. But, you know, Pocahontas is even like even more of a hot mess because John Smith was historically an asshole. 
And, um, you know, a lot like the Disney Pocahontas is based on his accounts, and that turned out great. But any, anyway, let, without further ado, speaking of horrible history, let's talk about the coronavirus. Lauren, take it away. <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> so, in terms of our quarantine edition of the weekly news, uh, as of yesterday, yes, I'm dating this year, uh, as of March 20th, uh, a lot of movies are being uh, 21st, slated. 21st, you mean? Huh? Uh, 21st, you mean? Uh, well, no, today's the 21st. Yesterday was the 20th, right? Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Never so, mind, sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, so as of March 20th, a lot of movies from different uh, animation companies and different studios are being released to video on demand and or to streaming services, depending on, you know, their how soon they were released in theaters or even if they're not in theaters yet. Um so what we were seeing is uh, Onward was released on March 20th to video on demand, and it's slated for release on April 3rd. And as we have been able to see over the past couple weeks here, um, it has not been doing well in theaters. Uh, and that sucks because it's, uh, if you tuned into our other episode about Onward, uh, we really genuinely liked it. You know, it was actually a fun movie and we have been encouraging people to go see it. Um, so I just want to interrupt because of the coronavirus. <laughs> I just want to interrupt and say, like, you know, I we were Rob Lauren, we paid full price to go see Onward, and then it came out two weeks later. <laughs> like, what the hell? I want, I want my or at least like half of my money back. I want like two months free of Disney Plus. Like, come on, man. Okay, the, and, and, and I know, <laughs> I know, but at the same time, I'm like, I'm at the same time, I'm glad we saw it on a big screen because it was one of those kind of stories where I'm you just see it on a big screen and it's in the scale of the world that they have and the journey that they go on. It is definitely worth it to see it on a big screen, but in the in the wake of the coronavirus and having it shut down pretty much every theater in the nation at this point, especially in California, where it's, you know, the entertainment hub. Uh, of course, ev you know, all these companies are trying to reroute for their movies going forward, uh, at least for the next couple months, month or two. Um, and uh, Trolls World Tour isn't even out in theaters yet. It hasn't made its release. And Universal's already slating it for uh, video on demand very soon. Uh, I don't believe a date has been released quite yet. But I know they're trying to. Push uh, yes, it, it is, is actually. It? Oh, it is. Okay. Yes, it is. It's a yeah, it's literally on the same day as it would be released in theaters. That's the unique thing okay. about Trolls World Tour is the fact that they're going to simultaneously put it out both in theaters and video on demand. OK. And so far, as, like I said, it's the only movie that's doing so. And it's the one that's pretty much taking a big risk and probably the one that people are keeping a watchful eye on to see how that is going to perform. Yeah. And not only that, it's the first time that they're doing it for, a, I mean, I think in general for any movie, but for especially for an animated release, uh, it's basically the industry entertainment companies are all trying to reroute based on this whole quarantine thing. So, uh, so obviously they're trying to make sure that they gain enough revenue off of this. But at the same time, uh, I understand that there's probably a lot of fears about that affecting entertainment going forward. Like as because the, because World Tour Universal hasn't had a lot of faith in it as a sequel. But then again, it's a sequel. So not, sequels don't tend to get a lot of faith from the studios in general. So uh, unless they're Shrek, you know, <laughs> but um, but for like for this one in particular, like the trailers actually look pretty promising, at least for me. I enjoyed the first Trolls and I was actually going, hey, I kind of want to see that in theaters, too. But if we're kind of all stuck here, I'll see it in, on demand and support it, um, especially because I know a lot of people are afraid that, that, you know, if they're trying to release these mid to low tier, at least in their perspective, movies to video on demand, uh, I, I hope that doesn't end up looping, you know, lumping a lot of animated movies into just the straight to video on demand crowd versus, you know, uh, having a lot of major animated releases on screen. Like if any, if there's any indication, you know, Frozen obviously can make major bank and Sonic technically being half animated, half live action made a huge, made, made huge amount of money at the box office. And that's already being slated for video on demand as well. So uh, that was just announced, I think yesterday. Um, so uh, yeah, so, it's kind of just interesting to see what's going to happen going forward and just what we can talk about potentially for the entertainment industry in the next month or two, how that's going to 
how video on demand is going to affect theatrical releases. Can I say a thing? Mm -hmm. Okay. Guys, wash your fucking hands. Like, please, oh God, <laughs> wash your hands. And, um, you know, I think the world should be fine in general. It just depends on how fast this or how long this lasts and how much of the economy is taking a hit on it. But, you know, and like, you know, I think people I, I'm just like excited in some way, in some like pessimistic way because everything's on fire and, and YouTubers are like, it's our time to rise. Everyone's stuck at home. <laughs> we only need ourselves <laughs> to make content. Aha. So, um, but yeah, wash your hands, stay inside. Listen, don't don't talk to your friends via Discord or Skype. They're both free, you know, like and don't 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 panic. Like do mental health activities because watching the news for hours and hours on a time as the the death toll and the and the 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 people that catch it rise is not healthy. I had to tell my mom to stop watching the news because you know, it's 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 like how many how many doctors can they interview? How many times can they can Anderson Cooper like talk to like reassure everyone the same things over and over like it's not it's not gonna help you like like watch it once a day for a half an hour just to get an update and then go read a fucking book okay that and and mm -hmm. spiel. <laughs> or learn no, how I to agree. draw it's... yeah <laughs> yeah exactly yeah I... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that is a very good point. But uh, going back into the subject, the, the the funny thing about it is that um, uh, just a few hours ago, I was doing my podcast and I was actually talking about this thing about how the coronavirus is affecting uh the 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 entertainment industry in general because right now we are at a point where they have no choice but to adapt right now, which is why this week um, we're seeing most of the big movies of 2020 being released digitally down to the point where even Disney is actually giving in and doing so with uh, Onward. Uh, but then again, like we still see them do the same thing where they're trying to delay many of their upcoming releases where Disney even took a, a bunch of their movies and delay that twice. And we're seeing other, uh, other companies doing so like Warner brothers, Sony universal, uh, like all of them are doing it. But with this coronavirus, we are at a point where we do have to wait and see with how things are going on, because this could definitely be a major game changer in um, in entertainment history. This could be something that could help boost up the popularity of streaming services and have them be more dominant in the industry, rather it be for television or with movies and stuff like that. But then again, we don't fully know how long this is going to last. We don't know if things will immediately be back to normal. And especially the case, um, how this is going to affect them uh, in terms of their business and in terms of their economics. Because all the major studios are getting a serious big hit. And one thing I was discussing about uh, was also the fact that uh, I do predict there could be a strong chance we will see a major buyout coming out of this. Like one mega corporation is going to have an opportunity to take advantage and actually buy out one of the major studios uh, because like they were hit so economically bad. Like their stocks were, were going so down to the point that they were weak enough for them to go and fully buy them out. Like there was a rumor spreading around this week regarding the fact that Apple would have a chance to buy Disney, like the, the entirety of the Walt Disney Corporation, because like Dis Disney took a massive hit because like their movies are crap, like their movies were taking a hit and also their theme parks are taking a hit as well. So that like there's no confirmation, but the uh, the analysts who brought up this theory said that if they could, they would. Now, maybe that's not going to happen, but I do see the strong possibility that a scenario like that could happen because some of these big studios were so crippled by uh, the socioeconomics of the coronavirus that e eventually we could see in a few months a mega corporation is going to go and buy out one of these companies in order for them to really make them grow, um, like, like to really have them get a big step in the entertainment industry. That's at least my prediction of it, but we could definitely see that we are at a point where things are definitely changing because of the coronavirus, but we do have to take it one step at a time to see how this is going to affect in the long run.
Yeah. It's it's kind of funny. I something I have been thinking about a lot is just, you know, how recently uh Bob Iger stepped down at Disney and and had Bob Chapek step in and all, suddenly all of this goes down. I can't help but feel like this is just like Eisner all over again where <laughs> it's just like you know, here's a disaster, you're handed this now. Deal with that. <laughs> I about to head out. <laughs> Bob, you take care of things. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Wait, what? <laughs> Bob Iger started the coronavirus. I can, you know, like, let's get the conspiracy theory going. <laughs> oh, God. It's because it's the Bob virus. <laughs> but it's just something oh, I couldn't yeah. stop thinking about. Like, not to start any crazy conspiracy theories. I just thought it was kind of funny that it's just history repeating itself in one form or another. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. And I don't think it's going to be the first nor the last time that it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's just two coincidence of timing or maybe Bob Iger just secretly knew because he saw like what's been happening in China. So he decided to step out early. And, and plus the fact that it is so unexpected that he just left the company and decided, all right, you're the new boss now. Mm -hmm. Have fun, everyone. Lauren, oh, yeah. Yeah, Lauren and I discussed it. Um, last episode or a couple episodes ago, but we're just like, did he did he do a thing? Did he stick his dick where he wasn't supposed to? I guess time will tell. <laughs> so you know, I hope I hope not. You know, I hope like of all the the Me Too like horrible monsters, like Bob Iger isn't also on that list. But you know, it's it's it 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 just makes logical sense time wise timeline wise, and you know, I'd hate to see that be the, the situation but i don't know we'll see what happens then again we then again we would probably like i would probably argue we would know by now if bob did anything i mean they managed to take down the ceo of warner brothers or i think it was the president yeah. of warner brothers because of the hashtag me too movement mm -hmm. and at this point we would have probably known if bob yeah did i anything. mean they did they also yeah. did take um lassiter i mean lassiter i don't think was as I mean, he's not he's not Harvey Weinstein, but um, I I I'm glad he he got he he got some sort of punishment for, you know, being inappropriate versus like at least at least he wasn't raped and people, you know, the the the, the way of openness in this not as bad, but still pretty yeah, still bad, right? Recently bad, but um, okay. I, I um, any other points, Lauren, before we let Matt just talk for like 45 minutes. <laughs> um, I guess, I mean, we pretty much, I feel like we covered a lot of points here because yeah, go, especially with uh, t tying it all back to, you know, what's been going on the past couple months here is just a lot has changed. And this is just the biggest, the biggest instance of change for all, everybody's lives. Um, but especially for the entertainment industry. So, I mean, it's just interesting to see how this will develop. And yeah, like to Matt's point, this will be a game-changing move for the entertainment industry to see all the stuff go to on-demand so quickly. Um, and especially, it, we just want to make sure that, you know, that the animation industry is taken care of. And actually, this will also probably affect uh, animation jobs. Because, I mean, as far as I know, I have, I have a lot of industry people who are all telling me, oh, we're working from home at this point, you know, working on stuff and because uh, everybody's got a Cintiq or everybody's got the program. So, I mean, this this could very well affect animation jobs going forward as well. It's not just going to be the independent freelance animators. It's going to be like it, we could see definitely major companies doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in, in, in a first world country too, entertainment is probably least of the concerns if this is like, I mean, I don't think it will get full blown up Full blown apocalypse, but I guess it's just like I don't know. Like we we can we can just like make movies later. We gotta like stay alive right now, so you know. But then again, if his uh, I mean, if history has taught us anything, entertainment is a great motivator to get through a lot of hardships. I mean, through the Great Depression, Walt Disney dominated the whole industry, and that's how um, he managed to lift people's spirits up with Mickey Mouse and uh, the Three Little Pigs. Mm -hmm. Or even during World War II, a lot of movies 
we're able to help people out. And like, that's why we've got like a whole series of cartoons from everybody uh, telling people to go buy war bonds and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So entertainment can actually play a very significant role in getting through some very tough times. So who knows, maybe like for this moment with the coronavirus, we will probably need some movies or some streaming services to get through all this. We're all holed up. What else can we do? I mean, it's <laughs> this is not much else. It's like, yeah, with and everybody's sitting at home Netflixing and and Disney Plusing and and all that stuff. So I mean, yeah, it's going to affect a lot for the demand for content. And so, yeah, and with people hold up, they look to hope. They look to something, some kind of optimism, something to make them laugh, something to make them smile in times like this. So, I mean, yeah, it's just like it's equivalent to having to maybe we go back to the points of propaganda films. I don't know. Make them laugh. <laughs> make them laugh. Make them laugh. Don't you know everyone wants to laugh? Yay, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, everyone go see Sing in the Rain. It's a good movie. <laughs> yeah, actually, genuinely good. So, Well, yeah, it's Singing in the Rain. I mean, like everybody says, it's like, it's one of the best movies ever. So, I mean, if you're a cinephile and you like movies, then, well, I guess it's one of those, like, you gotta watch it at least once. It's, 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 it's catchy. I mean, the plot itself is not, is, is a little bit like mishmashy but any we're getting off track um okay so today's episode is going to be history general history of animation like i've said so matt is going to do most of the talking from this point on and me and lauren will chime in if there's anything to add from our recollect our recollection of um of of knowledge i guess i feel like i know more than the average bear um and lauren's probably the same and i do come <laughs> Yeah, I come from animation background in school, and so I mean, my history of animation was also part of my background as well. So if I can chime in, I'll chime in. <laughs> okay, but um, so yeah, hopefully you learn a thing. If not, then um, I'm sorry. Hopefully you you enjoyed my my our antics and go wash your fucking hands. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, I didn't expect I'm going to take center stage on all this, but I am going to do the best I can in this case. Okay, so do we start at the very beginning with we, this? We get, now, do, uh, do the cave paintings what? and be like, technically, that was a form of animation because they were <laughs> they were they were showing movement through art and <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, if we're going to go through the art movement, then well, get ready for the five hour count. But OK, no, uh, in all seriousness, though, when, when we do look into animation, I mean, debatably, we can go and discuss about where specifically it would go and start, because like even before the 20th century, uh, we could talk about many of the inventions that were created that had the illusion of animation created where it's actually art in motion where you got a series of drawings put together and through certain movement you can actually make them come to life like uh the zoetrope is one of the greatest examples of that and one of the um earliest forms of animation now true animation as we know it did not start until the very beginning of the 20th century and that's when we would start to have like when the invention of film was created then so did animation and uh that's when we would start to have uh, cartoons and one experimental piece in order to know in order to learn how animation does truly work is um humorous phases of funny faces where you got one person drawing faces on a chalkboard and bit by bit would change the faces in order to go and create the illusion of animation. Now that is one of the first one of the first accounts of an actual animated film of for like one of the first cartoons. Now then uh, we do see a little bit of an evolution there one step forward when we bring in one of the founding fathers of animation, our boy, Windsor McKay. This is when he came in and and uh, he actually came in with uh, a few sets of his cartoons. But his true crowning achievement and what he is known for the most is Gertie the Dinosaur. And this is the first time where we would see a personality 
in a cartoon character. And that's why many people say that Gertie is the first cartoon character or the first animation personality per se. And what's interesting with that cartoon is that if you would go and watch it on YouTube, you wouldn't necessarily get the full experience because that cartoon is actually part movie, part vaudeville. Because during those showings, you would actually have Windsor McKay on the side live where he would present it like it's some kind of circus act where he would be on the side where he would go and tell Gertie it's like now Gertie you got to make sure and take care of Jumbo uh, Gertie now try to do a little dance and he would have like this little show like this little illusion where it's like Woodser McKay is um, presenting people this little dinosaur where at the end he would go back like he would go backstage and in the movie you would actually see a tiny version of him where um he would actually interact with Gertie the dinosaur and that was considered a major stepping stone in animation but then we would go and have Hollywood come in and that's when Hollywood becomes a lot more established and it wouldn't necessarily be too long after that where we would have our first cartoon star or a first set of cartoon stars and the first one that is recorded or one of the first prominent ones ever is Felix the cat and with Felix the cat that is the first time where we would see a set of cartoons with a recurring character where one by one you would actually see Felix uh, come to life in his little zany adventures and, and just out of curiosity ha have any of you actually seen a crazy uh, uh felix the cat cartoon oh yeah like or, or at least one of the earliest yeah, ones. oh yeah, yeah. there was Go ahead, lauren <laughs> i was gonna say there was one where, i mean this was also in an era where the cartoons they played in theaters and they were played to adult audiences so that tells you that from the beginning cartoons were really not intended for kids because i will tell you this one of the cartoons of felix the cat had his girlfriend coming up to him saying she was pregnant and then he freaked out and drank gasoline to kill himself because he couldn't handle the thought of having a family i'm not even kidding wow yep. <laughs> I was not even prepared <laughs> to think that Felix would actually go in that zone right there. I was thinking about Felix with his wacky adventures with that <laughs> magical bag of his. Oh my god. But I wasn't expecting Oh no, one of the early ones. Yeah, one of the early Felix cartoons. Like, because his even his design continued to change and grow and adapt and you know, to make it easier to animate. But it was like so in that early, early form, when he looked definitely more of a cat like i guess than you know mascot icon kind of thing that he um, that mm -hmm. he in the more cruder looking style is that I, that's what i remember because i distinctly remember sitting in a theater in college watching these on the big screen as part of history of animation and i remember sitting and all of us sat there at the end of it like um what <laughs> <laughs> this isn't what we expected watching Felix, but okay. <laughs> Felix the cat, the wonderful, wonderful cat. Oh, boy. <laughs> on, on a lighter note, is yeah. that, that's where the uh, three fingers come from, right? From Felix? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, the three and four fingers, because it's more as a, a quicker technique in order to uh, uh, create animation, because it's actually a lot cheaper, it's a lot faster in order to produce characters with uh, three to four fingers instead of the whole five fingers. But um, yeah, going back into what I was talking about, so when we enter into the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties, in fact... Um, the format that Felix the Cat created as the cartoon star, that's what a lot of people hope to go and create for themselves. And there have been a few, and like some of them would end up becoming a little bit more prominent once we enter into the 1930s. But um, th there have been a few that would come and go and stuff like that, like uh, Bosco from... Uh, uh, hi uh, uh, what was it? Hugh Hugo Ir Irving and uh, uh, Ising and... Uh Crap, Ising it. Ru Rudy and Ising. There we go. From uh, Bosco from Rudy and Ising. Or, or a few, uh, um, uh, what, what else would there be? Or like we got Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. But probably one of the most prominent stars that came out of that time. Like, uh, people did not get a full on, like, cartoon star that would be considered an A list celebrity 
until Mickey Mouse came in. Now, Walt Disney had a dream. He had a passion, as you know, that he wanted to go and open up his own studio. And he tried a few attempts to creating his own cartoons, which uh, resulted in the Laughograms when uh, he was in uh, Illinois or um, or what was it? Oh, no, not Illinois or something like that. Um, uh, like when he would have the Laughograms and then he would have his own cartoon star with uh, the Alice comedies and then Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. But then when he got screwed over with the deal with Oswald, it was then he created Mickey Mouse. And his first two attempts didn't work out all that great with uh, playing crazy and galloping gaucho. Can I add a thing real quick? But then he... Um, yeah, well, yeah, it, sure, was, sure, it sure. was Kansas City. Walt Disney was was born in Kansas City. Oh, yeah. Kansas City. Thank you. Yep, sorry. Little Missouri. All right. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, yeah. It, okay, I knew it was some, something. It was somewhere like either Missouri that's not important. Chicago it's or it's fine. <laughs> yeah. But Sorry, then Missouri. he... Yeah. Uh, then he added sound onto Steamboat Willie. And that's when Mickey Mouse became a worldwide phenomenon. Even surpass... Like, probably one of the first times that a cartoon star even surpasses the popularity of Felix the Cat. And from there, Walt Disney dominated animation at the time. And especially moving forward to the 1930s, he was the one that was really carrying the popularity of animation, uh, not only with his Mickey Mouse cartoons and developing other characters like Goofy, Donald Duck, Minnie, and many more, but also going into his more experimental cartoons with the Silly Symphonies. And during that time as well, you do see other companies jumping in, uh, like when getting into the 1930s, that want to try out their own cartoons. Uh, that's when you would go and have um, the Merry Melodies and the Looney Tunes, and when you would start to have a bit of those characters as well, like uh, you start out with Porky Pig and Egghead, and then when you gradually move forward, and, and also Daffy Duck would be among them as well, but then when you move forward, you'll see like more of the bigger and prominent ones like bugs are going to be coming in uh and then you would also have um uh the Fletcher brothers that enter the scene with their cartoons and they've had a pretty strong run as well with like betty boop and popeye uh and then you would also have mgm uh that are trying their own things and then you would also have um terry tunes that want to try to enter the scene where most of the animation studios at the time they're in california terry tunes uh they've established themselves in um, New York, where that used to be where the big entertainment hub is until uh, many people decide to move to California to go and escape the uh, New York rules. But then came the concept of the animated feature. Now, the animated feature has been a concept that already existed for a while. In fact, you could go as early as like the very beginnings of the 20th century, where you would have uh, Quirino Cristiani from Argentina, where he created a few of his own animated features. But unfortunately, um, those movies were lost in a fire, which really, really sucks. But then you would also have a few places in Europe where they already have their own animated films, but a lot of them are more stop motion oriented. Rather it be cut out animation like The Adventures of Prince Ahmed, mm -hmm. or you would also have um, like full on stop motion films like The New Gulliver or uh, Le Roman de Renard. Now in Hollywood, however, that concept would not appear like for them. That's an entirely foreign idea. But it wouldn't be until Walt Disney decided to be really adventurous and wanted to try out his own animated feature with Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. And at the time, a lot of people were really doubtful about it. Uh, it was once dubbed Disney's Folly. But then when it was released in theaters, it became a global phenomenon. It was a massive success and everybody loved it. It was really like it was the new star that could even top Mickey Mouse at the time, which at that point in the late 1930s, uh, Mickey's popularity started to go down a little bit because uh, other characters like uh, the ones from Snow White, along with uh, other personalities like Donald Duck, Goofy, and even the Three Little Pigs, which uh, I mentioned early. Uh, well, going well, anyways, um, 
Well, which they they started to overshadow Mickey. And which, by the way, I did forget to mention during the 1930s, uh, one of the big reasons why Disney did dominate animation uh, was that he really was uh, one of the most prominent figures that managed to go through the Dep the Great Depression very, very well. In fact, it was even stated um, with the uh, cartoon of the Three Little Pigs, that was considered a very historical one because um, it actually brought us the first ever uh, Disney hit in terms of songs, mm. Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf, in which many people even use that as an anthem for um, fighting the Great Depression. Like, the Big Bad Wolf is the economic depression at the time, and we can fight it back and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But anyways, uh, going back to what I was talking about, enter 1940, and that's when things really did change, because... That was when another global pandemic occurred. Well, not necessarily pandemic, but a life-changing event, World War II. And that's when not just Disney, but a lot of studios were struggling. And uh, it didn't necessarily hit hard on them, or they didn't realize it was that big of an issue until America started to, uh, to put themselves into World War II. Mm -hmm. And from there, you do start to see a lot of movies and a lot of production studios that were having a really hard time. Like even Disney, when he released uh, Pinocchio and Fantasia, they were massive box office bombs that lost a lot of money. And even um, uh, e even like uh, the Fletcher brothers, like when they tried to make their own animated films like Mr. Bug Goes to Town or um, their interpretation of Gulliver's Travels, it really did not last long. So then when they enter into World War II, uh, like I said just before, uh, that was when all the cartoons were pretty much making their own, um, war, you know, they're making their own war movies. They're making their own propaganda films uh, to, you know, to tell people to support the troops, uh, to fight the Nazis and um, to, to go and uh, help your country by buying war bonds or pay your taxes and all that kind of stuff. And during that time, there there were no real winners at that point because a lot of them were losing money. Mm -hmm. But then, when the war was over, that's when the whole landscape completely changed, and that's when um, people decided, okay, time for a new perspective. And when it comes to Disney's popularity, it really did dwindle down a bit, and that's when audiences were starting to be more interested in some of the other stuff that was offered. That's when we see the rise of popularity in other uh, companies, like uh, that, like after World War II, that was when the Looney Tunes completely dominated. That's when we had more characters like Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck and Elmer Fudd being prominent stars of animation. And then we would also have uh, the golden age of Tex Avery's cartoons during uh, MGM. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, I'm trying to think if there were a few others as well. Tom and Jerry was pretty well, big okay. too. Oh, right. For MGM as well, there was also Tom and Jerry that did emerge and really became very helpful for them, for MGM, to become prominent stars. Like, like MGM was, uh, you know, you know, not many people talk about them, but they were really quite a powerhouse, uh, especially when they had characters like uh, Droopy, uh, the, well, other characters from Tex Avery, like Screwy Squirrel and uh, The Wolf. Uh, and also, well, like whatever hot girls that would appear in Tex Avery cartoons, <laughs> uh, but also especially Tom and Jerry, where we start to see the rise of fame of um, Bill Hanna and Joe Barbera. So the car, so the 40s, like w when the late 40s occurred and things were starting to be different, like that's when we start to see the, the perspective changing, especially when Disney was still having a bit of a hard time to try to adapt onto animation and especially when in the early 1940s, there was the whole union strike occurred. Mm -hmm. And that kind of forever changed the landscape of Disney animation, especially uh, demand like when unions were demanding for better respect and better treatment for artists and animators. And from there, that's why in terms of Disney, that's why Walt's perspective on the medium pretty much changed. And that's why his focus went into other places like live action movies and theme parks. And you can see him do that transition where in the late where during the 40s, he was experimenting a lot with mixing live action with animation, with the three caballeros, with Song of the South and So Dear to My Heart. Mm -hmm. 
And then we enter into the 1950s, and that's when things completely visually change because um, during that period, what like an art movement that was dominating the whole uh, well that was pretty much dominating culture at the time was art deco when things were less detailed and were a lot more abstract and animation was definitely prom prominently showing that at the time especially with upa UPA was the one that really did change that landscape, not only because it's, it looks a lot more different, especially uh, when they hit hard and got everyone's attention with Gerald McBoing Boing, mm -hmm. but also it was a lot faster to produce and a lot cheaper to produce, which is a lot more appealing to studios. And that's why we see companies like Warner Brothers and even Disney that were getting into that with their cartoons, making them a little bit more abstract. That's why we would see uh, some of the Bugs Bunny cartoons or especially the ones by Chuck Jones, where they had a bit more of an art deco, an art mode, uh, an, a modern style onto those cartoons. And even Disney, like start like especially when you look at stuff like Toot, Whistle, Pluck and Boom, where they became a little bit more abstract and they let one of their animators, um, Ward Kimball, to be more dominant in terms of his style, to go all loud, to go all abstract and to go all wacky with it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, but then at the same time, speaking of Disney, though, that's when Disney did come back. Like he did make a comeback thanks to Cinderella. And from there, watching Disney movies became popular all over again. And that's when you see more classics coming in, not necessarily from Walt himself, but now more in the hands of his team of animators, especially the group that he refers to as the Nine Old Men. That's when you would get films like Alice in Wonderland, Peter Pan, Lady and the Tramp, and Sleeping Beauty. Mm -hmm. And this Art Deco would keep on going uh, even like during the 1960s as well. But during the 60s, that's what, again, thing, because, you know, that's the funny thing. In animation, I always like to look at things for every decade because during each decade, that's when things start to become a lot more different. That's when, like, now the whole aesthetic and the whole, um, uh, the, the the whole environment of animation becomes a lot more different because when you go into the 1960s, things again are a lot more different, not in terms of movies, not in terms of cartoons, but television. Mm -hmm. That's when they're coming in. And that's when you get Bill Hanna and Joe Barbera coming in because of the po because of the popularity of television. And the, from there, like cartoons on the big screen are becoming less and less popular so they got to go and adapt and they decided to go on to making works on television. And they've had a few, you know, they, they've started a, a bit uh, during the 1950s. But when the 1960s rolled along, that's when their cartoons became major hits. Some of the biggest television shows that were released at the time. That's when you would go and have the Flintstones, when you have Yogi Bear, when you have the Huckleberry Hound Show, the Jetsons. That's when tele that's when um Bill uh, like Hanna-Barbera was pioneering how animation is going to be for the next few decades and really establishing themselves while there are a few others at the same time doing their thing. Um, th there are some that are trying to adapt to television. Walt Disney did that very well, but in his own way, uh, especially using television as a marketing tool uh, to present like what's going on with Disneyland or their upcoming movies or using it to show like the Mickey Mouse Club. Uh, and then you would also have Looney Tunes, which they tried to adapt like they were having a hard time adapting it, especially like when you would have people like Frizz Freeling or Chuck Jones uh, working on their own things like Frizz Freeling having his own studio. And so did Chuck Jones, where he would go and produce stuff outside of the Looney Tunes, like how the Grinch stole Christmas. But uh, the Looney Tunes did survive a little bit by taking some of their cartoons during the from the late 40s up to the uh, 1960s and put them together like for the Bugs Bunny show or whatever you want to call it. The Bugs Bunny Roadrunner Hour, the Bugs Bunny and Tweety show, mm -hmm. the Bugs Bunny show or whatever. Like that was the way that the Looney Tunes did manage to survive uh, for generations to come. 
But television was starting to become a lot more prominent as uh, a film medium for animation. And as for Disney, like they were still continuing their own thing. They're still doing their own animation while they were still while at the same time, they were also innovating their own stuff. They were innovating their own craft, especially with the introduction of the Xerox process, which makes the whole uh, production a lot faster and a lot cheaper. And they started very well with 101 Dalmatians, which was a great success and especially a success that they needed after the massive failure of Sleeping Beauty. And then it would continue from there where they got a little bit of like they got a bit of success from the Sword and Stone. And then they also got the Jungle Book. Mm -hmm. But then we enter into the 1970s, and this is when things really go to crap. And yeah. this is going to crap for everyone. It goes to crap for Disney because Walt died in 19 at the end of 1966, mm -hmm. and even Hanna Barbera was not going as well. They weren't as strong as they used to. Like yeah, they had Scooby Doo in 1969, but then afterwards. They were pretty much stuck in a rut where all they were doing was just Scooby-Doo clones. And they were doing like if you thought like today's reboots were going out of hand. Oh, boy, you would be like fuming if you were in the 1970s. It was like anything that was popular at the time needs a TV show. And Hanna-Barbera and also Rudy Ising was doing a whole bunch. Or uh, was it Rudy Ising that was doing it? Or I think no, it wasn't Rudy Ising. Or what, what What was the other one? Crap. B wait, crap. Uh, remind me, who was doing the um, those those stop motion Christmas sketch? Uh, Rankin Bass. Rankin Bass Productions. There we go. Yeah. Rankin Bass was also um, prominent. Yeah. Rankin Bass was also there at the same time where they were also doing like their Christmas specials. But yeah, it was pretty much a dark time for many uh, but um, I, I always consider the 70s to be a bit of the ghetto age because mm -hmm. uh that's when animation was going through a hard time, both on television and also in movies as well. But there was one person that did manage to come in and tries to go um, a little more experimental. In fact, I, I also call it the ghetto age because that was the time when Ralph Bakshi was kind of dominating the scene. Mm -hmm. that, that was when Ralph Bakshi came in and he applied his own animations as well. Uh, when he would when he decided, you know what, we're not going to make kids stuff like why not just go full on adult with it? Like, why not go and make, you know, make make cinema for like the underground to make uh, to make like, ex you know, especially during the 70s, exploitation films were really prominent. So why not make an animated exploitation film? Mm -hmm. And he was really making a ruckus when he was making his own films. Like, uh, like not not just making successful stuff, but even controversial stuff. Uh, making uh, making works like uh, Fritz the Cat, which was often regarded as one of one of, if not the first X-rated animated films. I it was the uh, first, then you yeah. would all. Yeah, like the yeah, and the first. Uh, then you would also have heavy traffic, and then you also got coonskin as well. And from there, like they're a little bit cheaper, but uh, they definitely were a lot stronger in terms of the message that Ralph Bakshi was bringing out. So at the time, the seventies were pretty dark. So that's why the 1980s were a little bit of a rehabilitation phase. And at the time, uh, also, I just want to say for television, though, uh, that was when television was pretty much used as a marketing tool right now, because the 1980s was just nothing but shows that are meant to sell toys. Mm -hmm. And from there, that's where we would have a lot of TV shows ranging from Transformers, He-Man, Thundercats, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and even uh, Muppet Babies. Funny enough, like Muppet Babies came in and that actually inspired a massive wave, like a little bit of a trend of like taking classic cartoon characters and just turned them into babies, which is kind of ironic considering how Muppet Babies is actually a spinoff from one song that they sang from Muppets Take Manhattan. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the but yeah, for television animation, like it was a pretty prominent year, but it was the, the whole point. It was meant to sell you something it, it, like the whole point of those shows 
was meant to go and sell you merchandise. And, and another one, I think it came out in the 70s or maybe a little bit of the 80s as well. But another pro one, another one that was really prominent at the time was also the Smurfs, which was based on a Belgian comic. But Hanna-Barbera did manage to turn that into a really successful series. And debatably, it was their most successful show that they had during like um like their post uh, Scooby Doo phase, mm -hmm. like after the time they did Scooby Doo and like all the different crossovers with Yogi and the Gang or the Laugh Olympics or whatever, uh, that was when uh, like like uh, the Smurfs really did help them out in order to grow. But in terms of movies, this was the point where the old masters they like the old masters at Disney had to retire, and that was when the new people had to come in. Like that was when they had to go and pass the torch. However, at the time with the 1980s, uh, they were not like even they were not strong enough to carry animated features. And that that was when you would have to have others to go and uh, make animation uh, more prominent to keep the spirit of animation alive, per se. This is where Don Bluth enters the scene. And Don Bluth, like he started out at Disney, but he wasn't liking how things were going at the time. Uh, so he ultimately decided to quit. And that's when he wanted to go and create his own movies. He started out with The Secret of Nim, which a lot of people, including myself, would consider it his magnum opus, but it wasn't that big of a hit. But then you would bring in Steven Spielberg, who was the biggest name in Hollywood at the time. And that's when he would bring it that that's when he started to get a little bit more interested in animation. And he decided to collaborate with Don Bluth in order to create uh, some movies that he wanted to do that he had in mind. Stuff like An American Tale and also collaborating with George Lucas to go and make The Land Before Time. And they were becoming massive hits, especially when they would have the Steven Spielberg name attached to it. And that was at the point, like, uh, that that was the moment, and especially after the, like, the massive box office bomb Disney had with the Black Cauldron, where Disney woke up and realized, okay, we need to get our act together. And especially, like, the, the, the 1980s in general was a period for Disney when they had, when they realized they gotta get their act together, especially when um, Roy, Roy E. Disney, the nephew of Walt Disney, brought on board Michael Eisner and Frank Wells to run Disney. Mm -hmm. And from there, they were slowly trying to get at it. They were slowly trying to make their their works better. That, like when you got the great mouse detective and then starting with Oliver and company, that's when you start to see that, OK, now they're getting back on track. They're able to be in the same league as Don Bluth and Steven Spielberg. But then animation started to get a little bit more mainstream, especially with the creation of home media. That's when you had video cassettes coming in and uh, they start to make uh, some classic films popular again when they decided to release, do release those. Like the first one that Disney put out was Robin Hood, but the first real classic one that got everyone's attention was Pinocchio in 1985. And that became massively successful and Disney decided to go and release their classics through that. And then their classics became uh, like really popular all over again. And then there was Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which that became a massive hit. And a lot of people to this day still call it um, a great masterpiece with the way it blends live action with animation. And also, the, like, it, it, the movie is just one giant tribute to cartoons, especially the golden age of animation during the 1940s and 1950s. And the first time ever we would actually see something that we thought would be impossible, an official crossover with Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny, or with the Disney cartoons and the Looney Tunes cartoons, along with some of the... Um, uh, MGM cartoons as well. I mean, like just by watching it, you can understand that um, the the Looney Tunes, well, not Looney Tunes, but uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit was definitely a milestone for animation. Yeah, absolutely. I I really it was, wish. It, Go ahead, Lauren. Oh no, I was gonna say yeah. I don't think since then that Bugs Bunny and Mickey Mouse have shared the screen. I think that was like still has been their only time together. <laughs> Yeah, still their only time, but it would be nice to see if they could do that again, just for yeah. fun. Uh, but anyways, uh, going back to what I'm talking about. Now, animation at that point with Roger Rabbit, with the VHS sales, and also with the combination of Don Bluth and Disney's films, like now animation is getting a lot more relevancy. And then 
Disney had their Snow White moment for like the third time now with The Little Mermaid. And that's when things really changed. And that was the key to enter into the 90s. Uh, like it, it has a few names, like the 1990s had a few names for animation. A lot of people would refer it as the Disney Renaissance. I like to call it the musical age because at that point, Disney became massively successful and they once again became the kings of animation, especially when they had um, uh, The Little Mermaid and even Beauty and the Beast, mm -hmm. which that really got a lot of attention, not only because it was critically praised and it was very successful, but it was also the first animated feature in history to be nominated for Best Picture. So at that point, that's when you would find a lot of other companies decided to go and they, it, it, they thought in order to have their own successful animated feature to compete against Disney, then they also have to go and be a musical as well. That is why we end up with so many uh, different musicals from like Warner Brothers, from uh, Fox, and even Don Bluth was doing it. Like his popularity at that point was going a bit down where he decided to go and follow the crowd and do what Disney was doing, where he would have movies like um, uh, Rock-A-Doodle and uh, Thumbelina, The Pebble and the Penguin and The Troll of Central Park, um, which their standards did not match up to the ones at Disney's, especially when Don Bluth decided to go independent from Steven Spielberg in order to have more creative control, because that was one of the downsides when working on An American Tale and um, uh, The Line Before Time. It was just, it was a lot more restrictive to work on because he only had, um, you know, he had Steven Spielberg and George Lucas telling him what to do. But at that point, that was when Disney was just dominating and really turned the like really turned animated films into a massive motion picture event. And from there, that's when you would see like not just Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast, but also Aladdin and The Lion King. And like some people could say The Lion King was when they peaked. But even afterwards, when they would have that little slope going down, they were still pretty big movies that they were releasing like Pocahontas, Mulan, Hercules, uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame and Tarzan. And from there, like when you go into the, the late 1990s, like that's when you would start to see a bit more competition that, OK, maybe there are other uh, companies than Disney doing animated films that are doing well. Like that's when we start to see Anastasia <laughs> that we talked about earlier uh, that became massively success successful. And then we would have DreamWorks Animation that entered the scene in 1998, which they'll play a major part in the next decade mm -hmm. where they would come in and they would go and bring out the Prince of Egypt, which they did a pretty strong introduction yeah. there. But then... Oh, no, I, was just, I just like these movies, so... <laughs> Continue. We for Prince of Egypt. <laughs> yes, but I will say, not all these movies in the 1990s were all musicals. There were a few that did try to do their own thing. But when we would go right smack in the middle in 1995, that's when we would see another massive milestone, another real game changer. That was when, in 1995, Toy Story came in, the mm -hmm. first ever computer animated feature. And that forever, that would later on forever change the landscape of animation, where it would become a lot stronger, where uh, computer animation becomes a lot more viable when it comes to being a film medium or as a storytelling medium, per se. There have been a few movies before, uh, like uh, starting from, like, there have been a few movies like in the 1980s onward, where animated films would try to incorporate a little bit of computer animation here and there, like um, the clock tower scene in The Great Mouse Detective, for example. Uh, but there's never been one where it's like 100% computer animation. In fact, that was during the time when computers were a lot more dominant, starting with the uh, with Rescuers Down Under. Uh, the old process of using cells in order to produce animated features were long gone. And that's when they ultimately decided they're going to go full digital in terms of coloring and inking uh, the animations in order to present their movies. It was a, it, it was a lot of hard work at first, but then by time they were getting used to it. But then let's look into television. And that's when things start to become a lot more different as well, where beforehand, like for a while, 
it was pretty much established that the only place to find animation on television or like the most prominent place would be Saturday mornings where you would have those little blocks where for a few hours on specific channels like ABC or NBC or whatever, that's when they would show like a bunch of cartoons for kids. But then you move forward. But then um, from there, like once you enter into the 1990s, that's when things really change when you would have chan like channels that would decide to go and like dedicate it to cartoons where you would have Cartoon Network come in and even Nickelodeon, which was which was on for a, for a while, but decided to get a lot more serious onto animation. Now, of course, Saturday morning blocks still exist or like like little blocks of like cartoons would exist at the time, like the Disney Afternoon or Kids WB and stuff like that. But uh, the real prominent ones that they would have would actually be stuff like um, where, where you would have Cartoon Network and you would also have Nickelodeon where they would really change the definition of what television animation could be, where they where um, you got Cartoon Network who decided to pitch tons of ideas with stuff like what a cartoon that would spawn out like very successful shows like Dexter's Lab. Uh, Johnny Bravo, Powerpuff Girls, Courage the Cowardly Dog, and so much more. And then you would have Nickelodeon that they would come out with their own brand of cartoons like Ren and Stimpy, Rugrats, Hey Arnold, and, and all those other shows, or Ro Rocco's Modern Life, and many others, where now we would start to have, like, prominent people, like, outside of Hanna-Barbera, uh, like, especially when Hanna-Barbera is starting to work closely uh, with Cartoon Network, in fact, like a lot of the show, like a lot of the shows that I mentioned for Cartoon Network are from Hanna Barbera, actually. Mm -hmm. But that's when they start to go and define like a new definition of what television animation could be. And again, like with the with the with the blocks, like you do have Warner Brothers coming out with their own cartoons uh, that you know that did perform very strongly with stuff like uh, Animaniacs or Tiny Toons Adventures, and even uh, the Disney Afternoon, where they were doing very well, especially during the late nineteen uh, late nineteen eighties and early nineteen nineties. Uh, with stuff like uh, uh, DuckTales, The Adventures of Gummy <laughs> Bears, uh, and Gargoyles. Like, they were dominating all there. So, that, that okay, so, we pretty much covered the entire 20th century. Oh, you boy, that water? was a mouthful. <laughs> but then... No, nah, I'm actually all good, actually. I can, I can keep <laughs> on going. Uh, but then, let's go and enter into the 21st century, where we enter into the new millennium. And that's when we would see a massive change in how animation looks. That's when, with the new millennium, we also add a new dimension. I've already talked about before how Toy Story came in and changed the landscape of animated features, but then it also got the attention of other companies and other studios who wanted to come in and make their own computer animated features. And that's when they had massive successes with them. DreamWorks came in and really changed the landscape with Shrek, which also became the first ever animated feature to win um, best uh, to win best animated feature at the Oscars, which was a new category at the time. Uh, then you would have Blue Sky coming in with um with, with Ice Age, and that became really successful. And Pixar was going very strong as well, uh, where they were still doing their own movies like uh, Toy Story, Bugs Life, Toy Story 2, and also Monsters, Inc. But unfortunately, at that point, there is a bit of a downside as well, where we would also have um, ha uh, hand-drawn animation, where they started to become less and less popular, especially at Disney, where starting at the 2000s, they were starting to lose their touch a little bit. People were, be were becoming more and more fascinated with the art of 3D animation and got less interested in Disney's movies that were still in 2D with uh, films like Fantasia 2000 or Emperor's New Groove or uh, Treasure Planet especially, even if there would be bits of computer animation here and there. But Disney wasn't the only one at the time. Even uh, DreamWorks was kind of struggling with some of their movies, especially with uh, The Road to El Dorado, Spirit Stallion of the Cimarron, or the one that the one that some people could say like was the straw that broke the camel's back for DreamWorks was uh, Sinbad. Mm -hmm. So from so from there, 
Uh, eventually, like even those companies ultimately decided, OK, if we're going to move forward, then we're just going to then we might as well just do computer animation. That's why even Disney after Home on the Range, uh, they gave up on it and decided to go with um, to, to move forward with computer animation with Chicken Little. And after Sinbad, uh, DreamWorks was still going on and um, they were mass producing their movies like they were releasing no joke like two to three animated features annually and they were doing a really good job at it as well especially when bringing out uh franchise like even when it comes to developing franchises like during the 2000 decade like they had shrek and then they also had madagascar and also they had uh, kung fu panda as well so they were doing great but the ones that were the masters, some people could say Disney still held on to it, but really it was um, Pixar. Mm -hmm. Pixar was the one that was really dominant, that, that was really a big deal when it comes to animation. And they were pretty much um, carrying, they, they were pretty much carrying the torch that Disney had before where they were the true event animated features, all massively critically praised, all beloved by audiences and all huge successes, almost one after another, where a lot of people think that like the, the Pixar movies were like untouchable at the time. And then uh, like in terms of television as well, that's when things, I guess, were becoming a bit more experimental. I, I guess you could say there was a little bit of a downtime or, or like, or at least like the night, like a lot of people would say the nineties were like television's prime. And then things got a little bit down. Um, like after, like with uh, Nickelodeon, like they really changed after they received SpongeBob SquarePants mm -hmm. and that, that thing became a massive phenomenon and became the main, uh, like pretty much their main go-to show, uh, to carry the torch. And, but there were a few other shows that they also had, like they, they were still going well with like Rugrats and they also had fairly odd parents as well. But like, really, it was SpongeBob that was just dominating Nickelodeon. And as for Cartoon Network, like they were still going all right, but they never truly had a show that was like really up in the scales that was like back in their heyday in the 90s. Like they, they had some strong shows as well. Like they had Kids Next Door. They had Samurai Jack. Uh, they, they they had a few others. And especially like Ed, Ed and Eddie was like pretty prominent uh, during the 2000s mm -hmm. since that was done in uh, 1999. But they were still going at it. They were still running their business uh, pretty well. And uh, from there, I guess now would be the time we would get a little bit closer where we enter into the 2010 decade, the decade in which we just went through. Yeah. And this is um, this is the period for movies where not just animation, but for film in general, where franchises became a lot more important. Uh, like the model that DreamWorks Animation had during the 2000s now started to be more implemented everywhere. Now, ev like pretty much everybody's doing it and they're aiming more to have a franchise more so than an actual movie. Even Pixar had a little bit of sequelitis there where they were developing their own sequels. And the movies that they've released at the time, you pretty much got a massive mixed bag. There were some disappointments like the Cars sequels, Monsters University or The Good Dinosaur. But then you would also have some major hits as well where you would get like Toy Story 3, um, Inside Out or even Coco. But it, it is true though that like from there, like a lot of it wasn't just Pixar, but a lot of companies were really going up and down. Like DreamWorks had like DreamWorks had a really rough time where like during the 2010s, like, yeah, they had a few successes, especially with the How to Train Your Dragon movies. But from there, like they they had a really hard time going down Um like they had a box office bomb after box office bomb to the point where they were losing so much money. They had to lay off hundreds of animators and artists uh, to the point where inevitably they ended up getting bought off by Comcast. Mm -hmm. And even uh, Sony, Sony Pictures was also another one that was having a bit of a hard time where like they only had Hotel Transylvania. That was their most successful hit uh, in terms of franchises. Well, that and the Smurfs as well. But then you also had the Sony hack, which really just 
punched them to the ground and it took a while for them to slowly climb back up. So there were a few companies that were having a bit of a hard time. But then you would also have, well, once again, Disney coming in and carrying the torch where Disney decided, OK, for their animated films, they're going to do a little bit of a mix. Now they're getting used to computer animation and now they fully know what to do with it. And from there, they decided to go to really to, to go and create traditional movies where they would do the fairy tale type musicals like uh, Tangled, Moana and especially Frozen. And then they would also go and make more contemporary movies as well to be a bit more experimental and to be a little bit more uh, set in the modern age, per se. That's when we would end up with movies like the Wreck-It Ralph films, mm -hmm. Big Hero 6, and also Zootopia. And um, on top of that, it was also very interesting with the 2010s where they decided to be a lot more experimental with the computer animation. It almost feels like, OK, it seems like everybody's kind of doing the same thing with computer animation. But now they want to try to go and explore what else they can do with it. If they're not going to go back to hand drawn, then let's see all the different ways that we can manipulate computer animation to create new stories. And from there, that's when we would see some new innovative uses of computer animation with stuff like the Lego movie, the Peanuts movie, or even stuff like uh, Captain Underpants, the first epic movie. Uh, and even like some of some of the Disney films even got a little more experimental, like especially uh, Inside Out, for example. That's when we see animation going towards a, a, a new direction or another great example. Can't forget, of course, uh, Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. Mm -hmm. Where now we see new way, like now there are new ways for computer animation to wow us and to really surprise us. And even incorporating different elements as well when it comes to adding on to uh, uh, what, what else you can do with uh, computer animation. Where you can even add in some uh, hand drawn elements as well. Like you could try to slip it in uh, in order to go and produce a different look. But also financially, when it comes to these movies, this is also the first time where we start to see animation becoming major blockbusters. That's when we start to see, like starting with Toy Story 3, where we start to see animated films getting over a billion dollars at the box office, which at the time was once considered impossible, but now they start to become more and more common. That's when we start to see movies like uh, Toy Story 3, Toy Story 4, uh, to the Frozen films, uh, when we would see Inside Out, uh, Finding Dory, The Incredibles 2, Zootopia. That's when, like, now we're starting to see billion dollar hits with animated features. But it wasn't just Disney. There was also a newcomer in the animation field that they came in and they really made a major stamp, like it or not, uh, in terms of like uh, they made a major stamp in pop culture and that is Illumination Entertainment mm. with their movies like the Despicable Me films, The Secret Life of Pets, Sing and a, a few others as well. Where like right now, Despicable Me, as we are recording this, is the most successful animated franchise in history. And uh, from there, we also see a little bit of a change up with television animation as well, where they also decided to be a bit experimental, too, especially in the art style where they wanted to be a bit more psychedelic. And this is especially prominent with um, Cartoon Network, where they decide to go with a more psychedelic art style, especially with stuff like uh, Adventure Time or uh, The Amazing World of Gumball, where they really want to emphasize um, what, what kind of unique cre creativity that animators can bring out in order to produce their own content. But also, at the same time, we are starting to see shows that also decide to go and get onto more serious subject matter to talk about social issues that were once very taboo, which some people could say are still taboo, but now even animated shows that are aimed for kids that would go, they would go and discuss about. And one of the most prominent ones is LGBT themes. Mm -hmm. That's why we would see shows like um, The Legend of Korra and Steven Universe where they would emphasize those and they would go and decide to get into serious subject matter or even discuss about things like uh, uh, mental illness, um, you know, talk about social class or uh, ethnicities and like many different um, like really tough subject matters that 
you you'd think only adult animation would go and discuss, but they would still be pro they they would be prominent in kids shows as well. And, and speaking of adult animation, like of course it's almost non-existent in animated features unless you watch stuff like anime or like small indie films as well. Mm. But um like it, 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 they they were pretty prominent especially during the 2000s when you would have stuff like Adult Swim and then they start to become bigger and bigger once we enter into the 2010s and then when you uh, especially when you enter streaming services mm -hmm. like when streaming services came in especially with BoJack Horseman that's what truly defined what can be um a, an adult animation to this day, which then we would see others that would go follow suit like Big Mouth or Tuka and Birdie or even um, like we would also have other shows like that would air on television. But um, like they are adult oriented, but they're very successful and they made a big stamp in um, in in, uh, in our pop culture, like Rick and Morty, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, uh, would there be anything else to go and discuss about? Oh, wait, well, technically, I guess the only thing would be like Nickelodeon's involvement, but I don't think there really is much change that like their format is still kind of the same where like they're still uh, like they're kind of adapting onto streaming services. They're still heavily relying on SpongeBob, but they do have a few shows that did become successful, like The Loud House. Mm -hmm. And from there, I think that pretty much covers it with the whole history of animation, or at least Western animation. Yay, we did it! Yeah, <laughs> yeah, especially with yeah, that was that, that was a mouthful. So hopefully, you got that all registered in your yeah, heads. Yeah, no, we got it. <laughs> you can watch this several times if 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 you need, you know, if you've never like if you don't have a content condensive you know understanding about general history of animation. But yeah. Um, I think a lot of people just kind of. This is the this is the general this is the condensed yeah. version. That's yeah, I the mean, thing. like they can watch so the, the podcast so. episode, you know, if they're if they don't catch it all um, over and over again, you know, just 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 do it forever. You don't got nothing to do, right? Coronavirus, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, the best part is is that things continue to evolve and things continue to change, and you know, all these studios will continue to produce new content. Uh, whether it be for streaming services, whether it be for television, whether it be for film. I mean, it's even for like online exclusive content, it's all going to be there. And so, and we'll be, and we'll be here to keep an eye on it and report on it. So. <laughs> Yay. Or else we'll just talk about, you know, our stupid bullshit. Hey, hey, Lauren, how's your dog? My dog's okay. You know, I took my fish on the airplane. That's, that's my life right now. So I did see that picture. <laughs> you went on an airplane? Um, yeah, I had to, I, 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 I went to my parents' house to be quarantined and I needed to bring my fish home because my roommate was not going to take care of my fish for a month because, you know, I don't know if anyone knows about fish care, but you have to clean the tank like about, you know, every every couple of weeks ish, you know, even just for a beta. So I put the uh... fish in a coke in a coke bottle. Um and he came on And she strapped the coke bottle into the plane seat because there was nobody on the plane. <laughs> Oh wow! Lucky yeah, you. Yeah, he's he's he's, and I got I got to fly out straight from Burbank instead of going to LAX because like the flights were so cheap. <laughs> so that was the first time I could do that, and I wish I could do that all the time. But LAX is 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 cheaper, so you know whatever. <sighs> Shrug. Okay. Um, I think I think we're good. Unless Lauren, do you have any other questions or any points of discussion you want to bring up as as Matt Matt catches his breath? <laughs> <laughs> well considering i feel like a lot of stuff was already covered um and yeah and and it's just like as to my earlier point where you know all these studios will be producing new content and releasing new content uh you have shows uh uh what was it, like a, a glitch text that just came out in loud uh, sorry not loud house owl house the other house <laughs> and all of these other shows that are going to like disney plus or they're uh going straight to tv and then they go to online so, I mean, it's, yeah, we'll continue to see how, you know, the messages evolve in shows and especially with, yeah, even Loud House has been addressing uh, LGBT uh, families and and uh, storylines. And so it's, yeah, so, I mean, especially when you have shows like Steven Universe and Korra that definitely laid the groundwork going forward for animation. 
So, uh, and then you also have just in general, just different kinds of storylines that, you know, because now it's more, I think now more than ever, there's a lot more shows that are creator driven rather than studio driven. So it's really nice to mm -hmm. see that we're getting all of these different stories and it's because the creators are telling them, not the studio saying we need more of this and more of that. Yeah. And I'll just say for people who, who are like, why is this important? I'm, I'm, I'm good with the gays, but you know, why do we need to put them in our cartoons? Uh, it's all about representation and the more, mm -hmm. So people feel like, you know, that's like just common theme with media and storytelling in general is people feel like they're not outside the norm if they're being represented, rep represented. Yeah, that was the right word. So, you know, same, represented. same thing with Simba <laughs> in, 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 in my like the reason I like Simba so much um, even beforehand is is like because because PTSD, I relate to the, the, the lion. So, you know, it's it's even like things <laughs> like that. So and it also helps establish a norm for people who are not as open minded. Modern Family, I always cite as a really key insight of like uh, normalizing um, LGBTQ plus um, relationships because straight people are watching Modern Family and they're just like, oh, Mitch and Cam just love each other. And I'm like, that's the point. So um, mm -hmm. even if you don't care, it's still important just to um, for for minorities who, you know, need be like educate the 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 straights. I guess like you know I don't know. <laughs> I guess I'll I'll shut up. Yeah. But yeah, representation is so important. It, it's pretty much the show. But it's just to show that minority groups are no different than straight white cis males. Yeah. Basically, yep. not everyone is it's like it. And <laughs> Go ahead, Lauren. Animation is always going to be important in that respect because I, I feel like so many so many messages with animation because it's not just a kids medium. It seems like now more than ever, a lot more people are looking to animation for those kinds of messages, and it's because it can address it. It doesn't have to address it in a harsh way. It re it it addresses it in a way where we can all connect to it because art in itself is something that's universal. We all can interpret it how we will but it also conveys messages when we need them to so i think that's what's really nice about it and something that everybody can enjoy yeah and the reason why i will say why we are seeing more of a growth of even adult like more adults that are enjoying animation and more adults being animation fans is because um we we do start to be aware, like we are more aware of how they are made we are more aware of who's behind the scenes and especially with stuff like the internet mm -hmm. um like we're, we're pretty much like we we have all access pass to look like what's look at what's behind the curtain which would help us give more admiration of the amount of hard work that's actually put onto uh the animation stuff that's why we are seeing individual artists that are getting more credit uh that we we are even seeing more animation superstars per se yeah and also not even that's not even going into the whole realm of of freelance animators online and stuff like that so I'm like that's a whole other episode of itself yeah, with like we'll, new grounds we'll, and mm -hmm. all those animators so we'll, we'll get <laughs> but to show you it's yeah <laughs> but to show you that history keeps going on and on like we didn't start the fire. I was I was about to start saying we didn't start this fire, so I'm glad you caught me first. <laughs> I'm sure I, I'm like ninety percent sure there's a coronavirus version where it's just like, um, but I don't know off the top of my head, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna ad lib something awkwardly. So um, I guess we'll end. We don't have Q and A this time because we wanted to focus on um, history and learning and you know stuff like that. So we might switch back to Q and A next time or another time depending on the order of these being released publicly so anyway thanks uh matt for stopping by and talking a lot we appreciate your time no problem no problem i'm surprised that i have that much knowledge just on the fly just on the spot just go, do it go boy it, it was definitely great <laughs> so um yeah so if you guys have a um, specific preference lauren and i got nothing but time um these these days as far as subject matter then feel free to let us know in the comments or on twitter or whatever i guess um and then we'll see you on uh, in the we won't see you you'll like listen to our voices pre-recorded but yeah um you can hear <laughs> us new episodes come out every wednesday uh, 6 a.m eastern on all this the the podcasty things the the rss feed so soundcloud and spotify and 
iTunes, I guess, and then YouTube at 4 p.m. if we forget, if we don't forget to upload the YouTube version like we have been, because, yeah, the main content's more important. <laughs> please, please subscribe. Um, <laughs> any, any other notes, guys, as far as how you want to end? Um, keep on watching uh, can animation. I do a can I <laughs> Can I do a plug yeah. on my thing? Yeah, go ahead. Is it okay? Yeah, okay. So uh, just in case, if you guys would like to learn more about animation, or if you enjoy my stuff, or if you're one of those people that actually doesn't mind my voice and doesn't consider it annoying, uh, you could go and check out my YouTube channel, Electric Dragon 505. I'm also on Facebook uh, and also on Twitter at Animat505. Uh, currently, speaking of animation history, what I am doing right now is that I am doing a big ongoing series, probably my magnum opus in terms of video making, Animation Look Back Walt Disney Animation Studios Plus, where I go into an in-depth historical look on the entire history of Disney animation from Snow White going all the way up to Frozen 2. So if you guys are uh, excited for that, then go check that out. I already got uh, five parts already out, and uh, honestly, I couldn't be more happy w with making them. Plus the fact that it does include some fun animations uh, by Logan Miller yeah, as Logan, well. Logan's cool. the guy. <laughs> well, it's a good, good, good <laughs> bean. So, um, yeah, that's that's how we found Matt. Actually, is one of the editors. It's just like you should try to collab with Animat. He he just goes into so much depth that I'm just like, okay, we'll send him a nice email, and then this thing will take four months. It's it's fine. So, um, <laughs> all right. Well, thanks everyone for listening. Go subscribe to both of us. I guess you can follow Lauren on Twitter because she doesn't have things i mean i think you technically have a youtube lauren and, and it's just go find lauren just google her. i have a youtube where I, I have a youtube where i can go talk to people <laughs> <laughs> so interact with me in the comment section if i show up there sometime you know just go ahead <laughs> usually i have because to, i'll be there usually i have to poke her i'm like lauren we need to do a thing and she's like but 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 my well she she doesn't work right now but yeah lauren has a full-time job and i don't so i have a part-time job so i'm usually the one like bothering people about shit which is it's fine it's this is fine all right well thanks again for listening guys and we'll see you on wednesday uh feel free to listen to the old episodes if you're new because we got a couple and i hope you like them forever yay okay yeah so stay tuned y'all y'all okay and thank you again man yep stay tuned all right no problem see you later right, dudes okay. bye Thank you so much for listening to Animation Communication on YouTube, Spotify, or your favorite podcast provider. We are really hoping this show makes a difference in how people view animation and media, as well as giving and providing advice for people all over the world who like or want to join the animation or media industry. If you liked what you heard, please remember to subscribe and rate those five stars, as well as tell your friends. Don't forget to subscribe to our main YouTube channel, I Love Kim Possible A Lot, and turn those notifications on. My name is Scribbler, and you have been listening to Animation Communication.